Hello and welcome everyone to another Invent Right webinar, Master the Art of Licensing. This is an ongoing free series that we've been doing for the public. And Stephen and myself, as the co-founders of Invent Right, we've just been having an absolute blast. Just to give you an idea of what Invent Right does, we coach and mentor inventors to license their products. We've been doing that for 20 years. We've had students in over 65 countries, and uh, we just really enjoy what we do. Um, and what we're doing with this free series is we're having a lot of speakers on. We're getting presidents of large companies. We're getting successful inventors. We've had some patent attorneys. And tonight, we have Ken Johnson. He is the creator of the card game Phase 10. And he is probably the most successful card game inventor in the world. Um, going to read his bio here. Steven's going to talk to you a little bit about Ken. And then we're just going to have a casual conversation. I want to remind everybody that you can type your questions for Ken or for us into the questions box. So look at your GoToWebinar control panel, type your questions in there. Don't type them like five minutes before we're going to end. And we can't promise we'll get to every question. And I know that by all our discussion, it'll probably stimulate different thoughts you have. So type them in the second you have the thought. We'll get to them as many as possible. And now I'm going to introduce you to Ken. So Ken, he's a, a lifelong entrepreneur and the inventor of the worldwide best-selling card game Phase 10, which he licensed for the first time in 1987, and it's still selling strong. He's been collecting royalties ever since. His current licensee, Mattel, um, is Mattel, and Phase 10 is available at every game retailer in the country, including Walmart and Target. Ken has invented and commercialized many other games, including Phase 10 Master Edition, Phase 10 Dice Edition, Kotcha uh, Card Game, uh, Monarch Strategy Game, Word Master, Word Quest Board Game, uh, Pocket Pictures Trivia Game, Bible Trivia, Dice Baseball, and Stake Your Cash. In addition to being one of the most successful card game inventors of all time, Ken has started and run numerous businesses. Today, today he owns Intellimax Inc., which provides software to app development fir firms as well as Brand Legacy Corp, a new product development firm. He is part owner in two other companies as well. He's also actively involved in mentoring children and young adults to become entrepreneurs. Both Stephen and I have hung out with Ken in person. The dude's just a really nice, really friendly, really smart, amazing guy. So welcome, Ken. Hi, thank you, Andrew, and thanks for having me. Stephen, what do uh, you have to say about yeah, Ken? I wanna jump in here and say, Ken, we're so happy to have you tonight. Uh, a couple years ago, I think I met you for the first time, mm -hmm. and it was in, uh, it, it was in, I think, Detroit or close by. Yeah, it was in Lansing at uh, Michigan yeah. State. That's right, and we're going to talk a little bit about that event that's coming up. But what really took me back, everyone, everyone that's listening tonight, what really took me back about Ken was he's so successful, but he's so nice. I was just, I was like dumbfounded by it. I was kind of a fan. Um, but he he was willing to share his journey, his information so freely. And you know, Andrew Krauss and I really believe education is everything. And Andrew's right. I think we're on our twenty first week of doing these these webinars. So, Tonight's going to be a very special night for me and for everybody else because Ken's got an announcement. He's got a new book out. We're going to talk about that. But we're going to talk about his journey a little bit. I know it goes back quite a few years. Ken, how many years have you been collecting royalties for on Phase 10? Well, uh, it looks like it's about 33 years. Yes. Now, now, you know what's really crazy, everybody? I don't know of any inventor that's been collecting royalties for that long. And I think one of the reasons why, great product, it works, great game, it works, but it your protection is a copyright. Is that correct? Yes. And, that's, and how long does that last? Uh, copyrights are last the lifetime of the inventor or the author, and then plus, I think it's 70 or 75 years. I think it's 70 years. So uh, it lasts my lifetime, and my son should uh, benefit from it as well. See? That's what's crazy, everybody. Like I said, I don't know of any inventor because most inventors are using patents, Ken, to protect mm -hmm. their inventions. But 
the copyright angle to the the card game was brilliant. Did you did you know that when you were creating this game that the protection would allow you to collect royalties for so long? Yeah, I knew that copyrights outlasted patents and as a form of protection. Uh, of course, back 30 some odd years ago, I had no idea Phase 10 would be as successful as it has become. But yes, I, I did know that it outlasts uh, patents. And, and what's even more intriguing to me is that trademarks last forever, uh, provided you maintain them. So Phase 10, the name Phase 10, I can own or my son and my descendants can own it forever. And that's critical in any pro consumer product. You really want to try to get a trademark. So even a patent uh, owner, mm -hmm. uh, when that patent expires, if they've trademarked that product, they can, uh, can continue to earn uh, royalties or, mm -hmm. or, or produce it and uh, make income from it. So can let's step back in time for just a minute because, um, you know, creating a card game or a board game, I don't think it's easy. So I'm going to guess when you were growing up, your family played card games and board games. Am I right or wrong on that assumption? Yeah, you're exactly right. And uh, uh, just to give you a little quick history. So at 12, I created my first game with my siblings. And we played that among ourselves for seven years. It was a game we called Dice Baseball. And uh, the name indicates how it was played. It was a, a baseball board game. You threw four die and you had a, we had a chart that would interpret what the throw stood for. And, and the object was like any baseball game. It's played nine innings and scored the most runs. And it was, it was among us very successful, but I made some mistakes, which I can talk about later that uh, the game wasn't successful in its marketing, mm -hmm. but I learned from those mistakes and, and sat down and um, decided to create another game. And that game turned out to be phase 10. Okay. Now, when you first started out, you actually sold it yourself, didn't you? I mean, didn't, didn't you print them and sell them or is that correct? Or am I just guessing there? No, you're right. So phase 10 has a 38 year history. We celebrated our 38th uh, anniversary on August 10th. Uh, so just, what was that this week, Monday? Um, and so the first five years or so, I produced them my, myself. In fact, my customer was Kmart, which at that time, 30, 38 years ago, was the number one retailer in the country. And they bought them, uh, they tested in a number of stores over the matter of about a year and a half and eventually put it in all their stores. And the first shipment of phase 10 came out of my parents' basement in Detroit. Uh, we shipped to 20 stores. And it kept growing and growing and growing from there. And uh, I, I contracted with with uh, various vendors to secure the components. So the cards were pr printed by a custom card manufacturer, and I think it was Missouri. And the boxes were made by someone else. And the instructions. And I bought the packaging equipment and had some high school friends come over. I was probably 19, 20 years old at this time, and they all came over to my parents' basement. We produced them and shipped them out. <laughs> yeah. that's that's, that's and pretty we incredible. The basement very quickly it didn't take long because uh, kmart kept ordering and uh i was out of the basement after the second shipment that was two months later because we we you know the neighbors were wondering what all these semi trucks are doing <laughs> you know driving out the neighborhood trying to offload all this product so uh we moved into an industrial space and i expanded into some of the other games that andrew mentioned in the uh opening and um, five or six years later, I started licensing to various companies around the world. So wait a minute, wait a minute. You're, you're a young man, you come up with this great game. How did you get in the Walmart? I mean, did you just call the corporate office or there's no LinkedIn and there's no internet. So how'd you do it? Actually it was Kmart. So Kmart okay. was headquartered. Yeah, Kmart was headquartered in Troy, Michigan, which was about five miles from my home. So they were actually the first retailer I called because of their proximity. And it took some conjoling and and uh, convincing to get the buyer to see me. Uh, in fact, he asked, I, at that time I was showing him the, the uh, board game, the dice baseball game, because again, phase 10 was my second effort. Uh, but he said, hey, why, why don't you send it to me and we'll take a look and get back with you. Well, 
I, I read into that, well, you know, we won't look at it and we're just going to blow this whole thing off and forget <laughs> about it. But <laughs> well, I decided, hey, you know, uh, the buyer's name was uh, Mr. Uh, Christensen, George Christensen. So I convinced him, I said, look, I'm, I'm only five miles away. Uh, is it possible I can take 15 minutes of your time and show this to you? Because you'll really appreciate it if I demonstrate it. So I guess my persistence paid off because he invited me to come to the headquarters. And uh, after six or eight months of, of some waiting and some effort, he put it in. And uh, uh, hmm. that was my start. Wow. What did your family think at the time when this was all happening, Ken? Were they surprised or? Uh, that's very interesting. They were very supportive. Uh, my father was very supportive and my, my mom and of course my siblings helped helped in the manufacturing operation. So they were all very supportive and hopeful that we could make it work. Okay. So, well, I, I don't want to, I don't usually jump in and ask questions that uh, the attendees are asking, but this one's very on topic. Margaret says, as such a young man, what was the source of the can-do thinking at such a young age, 19 to 20 year old, is young yeah. did you have an inspirational family member oh that's a very good question i've been asked that many times and because people are often they saw it as an extraordinary thing for such a young person to to walk into the largest retailer in the country and for me it was i didn't think i was doing anything extraordinary you know i was just doing what i thought i needed to do and i think i had a level of confidence that the buyer saw I mean, I looked him in the eye um, and just spoke to him. Uh, I guess I wasn't trying to be on his level, but I had a level of confidence that he really liked, apparently, because he trusted me to fulfill these orders. And he could have really gotten himself into a bind, but he trusted me to, to do what I said I was going to do. In fact, uh, when he gave me the national listing, he said, hey, Ken, um, you know, he gave me the actual the paper order. And he says, hey, don't let me down. And I said, Mr. Christensen, I'll give my life before I let you down. Hmm. And so he he really had this confidence in me because I guess I demonstrated a level of confidence. And so I tell people in response to that question, particularly the young people I try to mentor, I think it's really important to show a level of confidence. You can't be arrogant or anything like that, but be confident. It, it instills confidence. Look at adults in the eye, because all of us adults here on this call have ex had experiences with young people, and you know they're looking down at their shoes, or they're looking behind you, they're not really focused on you. But mm -hmm. when you've had that experience with a young person who, who talks to you with a level of confidence and in the eye, you've all experienced that, and you say, wow, there's something in this, this youngster. And I think that's what impressed him. Okay. Now, you must have been an A student in school, yes? No, I, <laughs> I was, yeah, A's and B's, not straight A's by any stretch, but A's and B's. But I was often bored in school. Uh, mm -hmm. I love reading books. I'm, in fact, I'm sitting in my home office, which has four, uh, three of the four walls are built-in bookshelves, and they're full of books because I, I love reading. So I, okay. I, I'm... Uh, an autodidact. I, I like self-learning, mm -hmm. and but I did uh, achieve pretty good grades in school as well. How important is education when someone's going to jump in to be an entrepreneur, in your opinion? Again, it, it goes back to uh, my desire to read and learn. I think uh, Brian Tracy, the motivational speaker, uh, said his quote was, never stop learning, you know, always be learning. Mm -hmm. And so I believe in that as well. And whether it's through um, formal education, college, university, or being self-taught, reading books, I think that's critical no matter what you're doing. Um, and in fact, another thing Brian Tracy said is if you spend an hour, and I think it's 30 minutes a day, reading on a specific subject, if you do that every day, within a year, you will know more about that subject than 99% of the people on the planet. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's critical. Is if you're going to get into a product development or any pursuit you have, study and learn as much as you can on that subject, uh, and you will know more than most people, and, and uh, it, that will give you an advantage. Ken, let's jump ahead. You're selling 
at Kmart. When did you decide that licensing would be a better a better path for your product? Well, it was at the time when I was trying to secure other retailers. At, back at that time, big department stores like Sears and Montgomery Ward and JCPenney, they all had toy departments. But we couldn't get any traction because they were all saying, hey, let's wait and see what Kmart does. Uh, Walmart was a small retailer in the South, so they weren't really on the radar screen much at that point. But um, So I, I started running into some headwinds on expanding the product. So I heard of, I'd actually did some licensing with Dice Baseball, my first game, and so I understood how licensing worked. So I decided, well, maybe I should license phase 10. Hmm. And so uh, because I'd already developed the, the uh, marketing and had the largest retailer in the country, a licensing deal was not a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the very first opportunity that presented itself, we jumped on it and, and put together a licensing deal and then uh, international deals start coming along. So I wound up with licensees in parts of Europe and, and uh, the business was growing and growing. And in fact, uh, within the, the first year I started licensing, I was actually making more money as a licensee, as a licensor than I was as a business owner. Got it. Well, that's amazing. Uh, looking back on that first contract or the second con licensing agreement that you've had, is there anything that you learn um, going forward when you could re renegotiate? Was there anything about that contract you look back though, you know, I didn't realize that at the time? Well, that's a very good question, Stephen, and I don't think we have enough time to respond to that, <laughs> really, but but uh, you're all, I guess my point is, you know, the environment, the world changes. So that yeah. very first licensing deal did not foresee, you know, the internet, uh, mobile, you know, smartphones. It didn't foresee these things. Okay. And so as these uh, technologies developed, we had to go back into those license agreements and uh, create um, provisions for the technology. So I learned a lot about that all along the way in um, okay. being, having the ownership of the IP to me is the most critical thing in going forward with as a licensor. Mm -hmm. uh, technically, you could license your patented product or your IP to a licensee and assign all of your IP rights. And a lot of inventors do that. But for me, I thought it was important to retain the IP ownership, the IP rights. And that's been fortuitous, that thinking, because uh, I have now something that I can still control. Um, mm -hmm. Until my licensee can't change the color of the package of phase 10 without my approval. They can't change a single word of the instructions without my approval. And as you can imagine, as a, as a licensor of a game, that's critical. I don't want them changing how the game is played because it could also change my revenue mm -hmm. stream, you know, my royalties. So okay. I, I think it's important to maintain the IP where possible because it not only gives you an added mm -hmm. level of control if in fact you put your agreement together right, but it also gives you something to sell later. Ken, um, do, you think, do you think you had a lot of leverage with that first deal because you were selling at the largest retailer already? Well, absolutely, okay. absolutely. If you can prove the concept ahead of licensing, it gives you so much more leverage. I got a better royalty rate. I got mm -hmm. advanced money. As you know, Stephen, it's very hard to do, right? To get a, a licensee to give you, not advanced money, I, I misspoke. They gave me a signing bonus. Yeah. So it wasn't an advance against future royalties. It was a signing bonus. And mm -hmm. that's because I had the leverage, because I had proven the concept. I had the largest retailer in the country. And aside from that, they gave me something in addition that I asked for. Uh, because I had already sold Kmart, the largest retailer in the country, I said, look, I also want you to pay me a commission, much like a salesman would earn a mm -hmm. commission for securing a new account. They paid me a commission on top of royalties for every deal that came out of Kmart. So mm -hmm. uh, by producing the product myself, which, by the way, I don't generally recommend to most inventors, mm -hmm. and we can get into that if we have time, but, but because I went down that path, I was able to secure a, a much more favorable sure. licensing deal, and it was no difficulty or problem trying to find a licensee. In fact, when that deal 
fell apart. I had that licensee, the company was called Fundex. They were my licensee for about 20, 22 years. We had a falling out and that's a whole nother conversation. But um, when I sued them, the entire toy industry found out about it. And until then, I had no communication with any of the larger toy companies. When they discovered that this license could be pulled from Fundex, I got unsolicited calls, my attorney did, from Mattel, Hasbro, Spin Master, uh, Cardinal, uh, the largest toy company in Europe, which was uh, Ravensburger. They were my licensee there, but they wanted the, the world. So um, that you know, by, by having a, a license and trying to maintain some control through the license, uh, it, it opens so many doors. Can, can you sound like a pretty tough negotiator? Where did you learn those skills? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I was just, just doing this over the years. And as you've seen many license agreements, Stephen, I've seen a lot of them too in helping other inventors in all industries. Uh, you learn what should be in those agreements and what you should try to get out of them. And I learned all this along the way, mm -hmm. but I was fortunate that that very first deal was was crafted okay. in a way that um, that was favorable. And then over the years, I learned more and learned more. And again, by reading and studying uh, this okay. industry, I learned what should and shouldn't be done. Okay, perfect. Hey, Andrew, let's go to a slide real quick. Let's see what we have up. Let's see what's next. Okay, everybody, there's my, I'm really proud. Thank you, Ken, for my sample, which is signed right there. <laughs> and I have that in my office. Thank you very much for that, Ken. Sure. <laughs> and there's Andrew, Joe Finkler, and of course, Ken. And we're over at Lansing for that event. And we're going to talk about it because that's coming up um, very, very soon. It's an event you do not want to miss. And Ken's involved in that event too, even this year, which is wonderful. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, what are we looking at here, Ken? So uh, on the far left there, that's the, the mass, I'm sorry, that's the deluxe version of phase 10. It comes with a tray and scorecards and so forth. That's no longer available, but that's what that was. And then to the top there, you see phase 10 master's edition. That's a big seller in Europe. Uh, next to it is Phase 10 Twist. Again, another product we sell in Europe. We're bringing those here to the U.S. They were available years ago, but they're being brought back by uh, Mattel. Uh, the electronic handheld, which obviously is no longer available with the advent of smartphones. Um, the dice version of the game, and that's an interesting story there, uh, is I did not create the dice version of Phase 10. And this, again, goes to the power of licensing and doing uh, and maintaining a level of control. Um, the Phase 10 dice game was actually produced by a couple of uh, uh, game inventors. Uh, that's all they do all the time. They're in Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, random games. They produced, uh, they created the Phase 10 dice version, but because I own the copyright and trademark upon which it's based, they needed my approval to market it. So they went to my licensee and said, hey, we've got this dice version. And my licensee said, great, we need to talk to Ken. They came to me, I reviewed it, said, hey, I gave it the thumbs up and we started producing it. It's phase 10 dice. Uh, and I got a royalty on it as though I created it and I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> and that was in the market for about 20, I think 22, 23 years. It's not available anymore, but uh, we had a good run with it and I made you know, a good chunk of money and it's not something I even created. That's nice. And then to, next to that is the, the older version of the mobile app. Uh, Mattel and I launched a, a new app called Phase 10 World Tour in October, and it's doing very, very well. Nice. Yeah, that's it there. So it's available on, uh, uh, at the App Store and on Google Play. Uh, as you can see, we've got 70,000 uh, reviews at a 4.4, .4, and it's it's really doing quite well. We're very proud of it, and um, um, very excited. It, it, I won't tell you how much money I'm making on it, but it's it's really doing well. <laughs> Congratulations! Ken. Thank you.
70 world tour aspect of it can you tell us a little bit about that so yeah there's several modes in playing the game and one of them is a journey type of mode similar to what you see in uh, candy crush and some other games and so as you travel this path and complete a task you move up down the path and and then you get rewarded and then each um, path has a, a theme, a country theme. So it might be Hong Kong, it might be Africa, it might be uh, France. So it's kind of like taking you around the world uh, through these various themes. Well, close to 70,000 reviews, I would say that's pretty impressive. It's, I mean, and that's only been since, since uh, October, November. We're doing very well with it. And in fact, that's just the Google. On Apple, we're probably close to 80,000, 70, 80,000 reviews. And, and it's got a 4.8 review uh, average over there. And it, it's just growing like crazy. I, when Mattel and I started talking about this, I had no idea that we could generate the kind of revenue it's generating. But it's, it's just been unbelievable. And, and, but that, I, I have a okay. question. Mm -hmm. This is definitely an evergreen product. And you don't see a lot of evergreens. I mean, of course, there's some games, Monopoly, and there's a lot of games that have been out there. But that's fairly rare to have an evergreen. What is the magic here, in your opinion, for this to keep selling? I think one of the tricks, first of all, you have to have a solid foundation. Fortunately, Phase 10 is based on a solid foundation. People like it. But to keep it fresh, you have to iterate. Uh, so that's why you see all these various versions of Phase 10. You continue iterating uh, spin-offs or extensions. Uh, you refresh the package on occasion. So actually the package that you had on your opening slide is probably two iterations of the package uh, ago um, because we changed, yeah, that one there is probably at least, uh, it's probably the previous iteration. The new one is, is a bit different, it's uh, fully blue. Um, so yeah, it, it's constantly refreshing the package and keeping it fresh in the public. We don't change the basic game on the original version, but we refresh the package. And then, as I said, we have these extensions, Twist, Masters. Uh, we have one called Phase 10 Strategy, which is available in Europe and doing very well in Germany. Germany is our second biggest market behind uh, in the uh, United States. And mm -hmm. so in Germany, we have probably four different uh, iterations of Phase 10. And so it's doing very well over there. Can I have a quick question? We had um, Rob Angel, the creator of Pictionary, on. Yes. And wonderful gentleman. And he talked about they sold a lot of Pictionaries. But I tell you, he had to travel the world to, to help sell it. Have you done that yourself? I mean, did you have to talk to the companies over there, any of your international licensees to help sell it? No, we, we didn't. It's... It's funny, um, some of our licensees contacted my master licensee, in this case is Mattel, and negotiated the deal. Um, and then sometimes we reached out to them, but I've never, never left Michigan. Um, <laughs> but yeah, for instance, our, our, that mobile app, the, the previous licensee, uh, they were a Canadian company, and because they had seen the success of Phase 10 as a physical product, they reached out to us and said, hey, can we, make a mobile version mm. and that, that started the negotiation so okay. i've been fortunate because of the success of the physical product it, mm. it actually has brought licensees to us okay nice. I, i've got a question for you ken what, what card games seem so simple compared to a board game less pieces less stuff is is it that much more simple than a board game and then can you also contrast it to an app so those are three categories a card game a board game, and then an app. What's the difference between those as far as the level of development and the complexity? Um, now, let's, if you take the physical products with card game or board game, the, the development is pretty much the same between card games and board games. Um, there's, a, there's a cadence you must engage in to develop those games. Uh, to give you the short version, um, many people are afraid to show their ideas to other people, and that's a big mistake. That was my first mistake with Dice Baseball. Remember I mentioned earlier, we made some mistakes along the way. Well, that was one of them. I did not 
test the game with a, a broad enough uh, group of people. In fact, I tested it with no one other than my family. That was a mistake. So uh, card game, board game creators, or any uh, product for that matter, you have to test it with people. You can get them to sign NDAs if you think you need to, uh, and you want to keep it. You don't want to make it public because that uh, could affect, particularly if you're going for a patent, it would affect that. But you want to test it with as many people as possible because those that's your market. Um, testing your market in product development, no matter whether it's a card game or uh, you know a new widget of some kind, you have to know what the market wants. You have to know if they understand the product, if they uh, are attracted to the product, would they buy the product. In the case of a game, the most important thing you have to test are the rules. And so when I tested phase 10, after learning from the mistakes of dice baseball, first thing I did after I created it, I would literally sat in my apartment and in a matter of a few hours and, and testing over a couple of days, I, I had phase 10. And so I, back then we didn't have computer PCs and word processors. So I typed it on an IBM Selectric, all the instructions. And I took the instructions along with my mock-up prototype to my parents' home where my sister was. And uh, I walked in, I gave my sister the instructions. And I said, uh, her name is Phyllis. And I said, Phyllis, I've got this new game. I want you to read these instructions and you tell me and our parents how to play the game. In other words, you as the inventor, you cannot have any input in teaching other people how to play. Because you've got to imagine that you're not going to be in millions of households over the years telling people how to play your game. They have to be able to comprehend it from the rules. So I rule testing in a game is the most critical thing. Do the rules convey the game? Um, are they concise enough so that when people open the package, they don't see an encyclopedia of rules and get overwhelmed, right? So uh, that's the most critical thing. And once they've read the instructions, can they play the game and play it as you developed it and get the enjoyment out of it that you think should be there? Uh, that's why uh, rule testing is the most important thing when it comes to games. Hmm. Very interesting. And the so difference here, between that and a mobile app, that's a whole different world and whole another conversation. But yeah, it still involves a lot of testing, but there's development uh, testing, there's play testing, there's a lot. It's a different level of testing when it comes to an app and probably mm -hmm. even more critical from the standpoint that you've got different devices it's being played on, you know, you've got different, uh, you got Apple versus Google and Google has probably hundreds of different phones and sizes and so you've got a lot of different ways to test, and that's a whole nother level of testing that that mm -hmm. uh, apps require. Nice. Mm -hmm. Andrew, let's go to the next slide. What do we have? We have well, speaking of speaking of apps, um, this is another app that you're you're doing. So, is there anything yeah. you want more you want to say about apps? Yeah. So, Stake Your Stash is a, a trivia app. We haven't launched it fully yet because we're, we're we're doing the testing I've been talking about. But uh, yeah, it's just a trivia app. It plays a bit differently from most trivia apps in, in that it's like Final Jeopardy on every question. In other words, you wager based on your, your confidence in your answer, how many of your coins you're gonna put at risk. If you're correct, you double them. If you're wrong, you lose them. And after seven questions, whoever has accumulated the most coins is the winner. So uh, it's a pretty cool game and we're hoping it, it has some good traction and success. And actually one of my companies is producing that. Cool. Next slide, Andrew. What do we have? Well, the last slide is you, you, oh. you wrote a book recently. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my book. It's called The Simple Plan. Uh, six easy steps to make millions from your ideas. Uh, I try to uh, boil down the process from concept to market in six steps. And I say they're easy steps and that they're easy to learn and comprehend. Each step requires work, of course, but uh, I think it's a, a, a direct path to the commercialization of an idea. It helps you do the most important thing. The very first step is evaluation of the concept mm. uh, before you spend any money on patents or prototypes or what have you. You must thoroughly evaluate that concept to save yourself a lot of effort, a lot of wasted money and energy. And that's the most critical step in the process. So I spent a lot of time in the book talking about how you can do an objective evaluation. 
and and determine if you should go to the next step and and in that evaluation you can get an idea of what the profitability of the invention might be well can let's talk about that for a minute because that first step if you miss that first step it's painful isn't it oh it's it's awful it's awful and we've had experience in talking to inventors i know i have and i'm sure you have too guys that you you, you run across an inventor who spent thirty thousand dollars on a patent and and then they decide to try to figure out okay what is the market for this thing or let's create a prototype and um and when they do that they find out that there's no market for it or they spent so much time a year or two or three working on a patent that the, the technology or the market is already past them. So uh, doing the, the evaluation is very critical to save yourself some time and money and determine what the real value of this invention is. Uh, as you probably know that most patented inventions by independent inventors do not return uh, mm -hmm. in royalties the cost of the patent. Yeah. That means that even if they are able to get a license, many times they don't earn enough to recover what they spent. So, and that's assuming they got a license. In most cases, they don't even get a license because then when they start to test the market or build a prototype, they find out that the product can't be built at a cost that it would be competitive in the marketplace. There's a lot of things that have to be evaluated. And I don't want to overwhelm people and make them think it's hard. It's not. It's just you have to take the appropriate steps at the right time to get down that path. Ken, let's, let's dive in there on this first step because I think that's a really important one. Okay, and I think you're right. I think the first thing that people do, inventors do, creative people do, is that for some reason they're a little fearful. Mm -hmm. So they, they file a patent. And as you know, you just said it, you know, I think I've heard this number thrown out many, many times. 97% of all patents never never recoup the cost it takes to file them. So, so how do we, we, I have this idea. So let's start at the very beginning because I know a lot of people are listening. They've got this idea. Their friends are telling them, hey, this is good. I, this is a great idea. You should patent it or their spouse or whatever, but they don't really know for sure. And so how can I test it? What are some of the things? I know one thing you mentioned, which I really like, when I think this is important too, understanding what it's going to cost. How important is that, Ken? Understanding its cost is one of the critical steps. Your invention has to do one, at least one of three things to have any chance of success. It has to be more effective than the competing solutions. It has to be more efficient than the competing solutions, and or it has to be more economical than the competing solutions. If it's not at least one of those three things, you're wasting your time. And the only way to know that is to, you can learn this through an, a good evaluation, but you also, and, and this is not true in every case, but in cases where it's cost e effective, mm -hmm. build a prototype so you can determine if in fact the invention will do what you think it will do. Mm -hmm. You can create it and find out, uh, you can make a prototype and find out, well, this isn't very effective after all, okay? Or mm. it's not very efficient at doing the job. It does it, but not as efficient as X okay. product, competing product. Okay. Or you may find out in, in the prototyping stage that, wow, yeah, it's effective and efficient, but it's gonna cost a lot of money to make this thing in, mm. in manufacturing, which will price it out of the market, right? So. Uh, you have to determine that at some point. It's better to try to determine it up front before you spend a lot of money. Uh, and it can be determined up front. Uh, you just have to take the right the time to do it and, and take the right steps and ask the right people. You mentioned uh, friends and family. So yeah, friends and family is the first line of, of, I won't say defense, but the first group of people you will talk to because they're easier access and um, you want to just get their honest opinion, which is hard to do because they love you and they right. want to see you successful so that you can't rely 100% on, on their response. But at least if it's absolutely awful, one of your family members will tell you. So uh, you start there. But then the next level is, uh, is to talk to the would-be uh, buyers, those people that are experiencing the problem your invention is designed uh, to resolve. So if you have 
uh, a new, I don't know, uh, curling iron, for instance, then you talk to women who use curling irons and find out would they be interested in a product that is more effective or more efficient in this way? How does it resolve the problem better than the, the solution they're already using? Mm -hmm. You have to talk to people that would use that product okay. and get their honest opinion. And if they're strangers, it's better because they will okay. be more honest than your family so, and friends. So okay, let's, let's jump back to the cost for just a minute because that's an area where everybody's, they're not sure of themselves. I built that prototype and I'm looking at it, it looks pretty good. It, it shows the proof of concept and sure enough, it's better than the other products that are on the market. Mm -hmm. Maybe I ask my friends, I still think it's, I'm, I'm gonna get to the buyer in just a minute. How can I get the cost? Can I just compare it with another product? Do I call a contract manufacturer? How do I know, Ken? Or, or how, should I know that level of detail even? Yeah, you should know that detail if, if at all possible. And you, you gave the answer there is to try to contact uh, okay. contract manufacturers. That's the first way to do it. Uh, when I did phase 10, actually the, I started with the, the baseball game, but let's just talk about phase 10. I reached out to, uh, I had three manufacturers build the components for phase 10. I had one company that did the cards, the custom card decks. Mm -hmm. I had another company do the boxes and a third company do the printing. Now the boxes and printing weren't that difficult. Almost any, well, the boxes are a little more challenging, but the printing, any printer could do it. And the boxes, there were you know, a dozen companies, easy mm -hmm. to find, sent them the specs. They quoted me a price per box at, at a certain volume. I knew what that was, no okay. real challenge there. The challenge was the custom card decks because there were only a handful of uh, card manufacturers in the United States 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. Of course you had US playing cards and Hoyle, they were the big guys and I mm -hmm. couldn't meet, their minimums were too high for me. So okay. I contacted custom uh, manufacturers that did specialty cards. Mm -hmm. uh, so for instance, if Coca-Cola was doing a promotion, they'd make the cards for them. Okay. Um, so I contacted them, told them I needed X volume. I, I gave them two or three volume levels so that I can uh, mm -hmm. see what it would cost at different levels and sent them the specs. They gave me quotes. So then I took the per piece number on the decks, the cards and the instructions and now I know what it costs. Plus the shrink wrap and packaging, I knew what it cost to produce them. So for a lot of your uh, inventors, you need to, if you if you make a prototype, you'll have a, a clearer picture on what components are necessary, and then you you contact contract manufacturers of those components, and they're everywhere. Okay. Um, there are companies all over the place that will make products okay. in whole or in part for you yeah. for uh, assembly later. Okay. And, and that's in this country, uh, not to mention what you can do overseas. Uh, there's a few extra challenges in doing it overseas, but mm -hmm. there are companies out there that can source uh, mm -hmm. products for you overseas and try how to put the necessary yourself, protections Ken? in place. How do, how do you protect yourself? Are you worried that they're going to take it, steal it? Uh, that's always a possibility, but um, the truth is that most companies, most things are not stolen, particularly unproven concepts. When you really have to worry <laughs> is when you've proven the concept, now right. you got to worry about people stealing it. Okay. Uh, example point. of phase 10, um, our app, we, we have uh, companies all over the world trying to steal, knock off the phase 10 app. So I bet if you, if you go on Google right now, you'll see a couple of apps that mimic uh, phase 10. Uh, okay. And then there have actually been some that actually called their app phase 10. Mm. Uh, the easy thing about those that call it phase 10, they're actually easier to deal with from an, an uh, infringement perspective. Sure. We just contact Google and Apple and say, look, they're mm. using my trademark. And all mm. I got to do is prove I'm the trademark owner and they take it down right away because they don't want to be a party to that infringement. Okay. It's those that Try to call it something else that make it more challenging. But, and then Mattel and I just determine whether it's worth going after them. Uh, good point. Ken, we can probably talk about this for hours, I think. <laughs> I, I, but but instead of that, you have everything in the book. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, yes. let's talk about it's the book. Just, let's talk about the book for just a minute, then we'll we'll ask some questions. Ken, writing books is not easy, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> it's taken me a while to get down this path. I actually wrote the book. Um, 
I produced a number of audio uh, recordings that in included everything that's in the book. So then I had those transcribed. Okay. And then I had to go through the transcription and make mm -hmm. corrections and additions and so forth. But writing the book has been a long journey, just trying to get across the finish line. And it's probably been a three year process. That's it didn't nice. have to be that long. I got busy in other projects, but mm -hmm. that's what it took. Are you are you delivering the secret sauce? Everything I think an inventor needs to know is in that book, you know, okay. uh, and it complements your books, by the way, I think quite well. But yeah, it's it's uh, it's in the book and okay. uh, and on my website, there's there's uh, information there. But I think all the basic things they need, I mean, is there. And what you guys offer is the additional hand holding, which I think is very important. But mm -hmm. uh, all the concepts are there. Beautiful. One last question, then we're going to open it up now. You're a toy inventor, a card game. I mean, you're you're in that industry, but I'm going to bet those same principles apply to other industries. Am I right or wrong? Absolutely. I mean, in fact, the book is written uh, not to card game or game inventors. It's written to any inventor. If you have a consumer product, okay. uh, the concepts in the book are for you. It doesn't matter what your invention is. I mean, I've probably consulted hundreds if not thousands of inventors uh, over the years in my speeches and one-on-one. -on -one. And it doesn't matter what their invention is. If it's a consumer product, mm -hmm. the concept uh, to bring it to market is the same, okay? Yeah. There's some nuances that might vary, but the general concept is the same, start okay. to finish. And okay. so uh, this book is for anyone with an invention that is a consumer-based product. Okay, everyone, we're going to open it up for questions, but I can tell you now, I know Ken, he's the real deal. He's going to give you all the secrets. He gave you a few tonight, so please pick it up and support Ken and the whole inventing community. So, Andrew, let's open it up. Let's see what we got, what type of yeah, questions. Yeah, we got, we got some great questions from, from everybody here. Uh, first question is from Leela. Uh, were you able to make a living off your royalties? Oh, when were you able to make a living off your royalties? Or were you employed in some other area? I think she's. This is earlier in the. Early on, summer. yeah. So when did that happen for you when you made that transition? Yeah, when I when I uh, and this goes to Stephen's question earlier. When I started to license, what motivated me in part was trying to find a company that can take it to the next level. And two, I was interested in another business at the time that I started and operated for 15 years. So um, when I started licensing, yes, I I was making good money. I I um, um, I was, uh, as I mentioned, I was making more as a licensee because I had a broader market than I was able to capture myself almost in the first year or two. So yes, I was able to make a living uh, from my royalties early on. And this one's also from Leela. How have sales picked up during the pandemic? And I'll add to that that we've had some speakers on that say that sales of puzzles have like gone through the roof. How have, how have you guys been doing during the pandemic? It's been unbelievable, unbelievable. Our, our sales from March uh, to May, I, in fact, I got royalties that just came in today from Mattel. Uh, so I haven't looked at them yet, but um, but I know the first quarter royalties and I know the projections on the second quarter, which we just got, but our uh, app sales went up from um, uh, March to April, 150%. Wow. And I shouldn't say app sales, but in-app sales, 150% increase. And our, I understand that our physical games around the world sell volume went up 25%. So the mm -hmm. pandemic has, and it's unfortunate because, you know, pandemic is not a good thing, but for games and apps, it's been tremendous because people find themselves at home more, uh, family time, game nights. It's, it's really been a boom to the, uh, to the game industry. This next one is about um, copyright. So you said the copyrights are the uh, life of the inventor plus 75 years, isn't that correct? Yes, it's either okay. 70 or 75, I'm not certain. Yeah, and, and I've heard, and, and they keep pushing it out, mostly from what I hear because of Disney's lobbying. So uh, Daniel writes, and Mickey Mouse copyright is coming up for Congress to extend. I heard, I've heard that they're going to try to extend it to a hundred. They just, mm -hmm. is it, is it the case that just Disney has so much pull, they're just going to keep pushing that out for themselves and everybody else? 
it would be nice. I won't benefit from it, but my son, maybe my uh, grandchildren will. Yeah, it, it's, you know, another thing about copyrights that a lot of people don't know, and it kind of goes to this point that I think they're making here, is there's a thing called the termination clause in copyrights. So, uh, for instance, my license with Mattel, in 35 years, if I'm still around, I can terminate that license and reissue it to whoever I want. That's in the law. It's called the copyright termination. So anyone interested in copyright, check it out, ask your attorney. But yes, you have 35 years from the issuance of the license to terminate. Now you have to jump through certain hoops in making that terminate, uh, termination. But yes, you can terminate it every 35 years of the author's life. Mm -hmm. So if I were 20, I probably could have two chances of terminating my license with whoever it's with and either move it to someone else or negotiate a new deal. It was designed mm -hmm. to give copyright owners a second shot at the apple. If they make a bad deal the first time out, they can correct it the second time out. And even their heirs can do it once. Hmm. Interesting. They should do that for patents. No, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a great clause. I've never heard that. I love that. Yeah, check it out. It's the Copyright Termination Act, and um, it gives uh, it gives us a second shot at it. On a similar uh, question, we have a question from Jeff, which is basically, I can tell, is he's not understanding the difference between a word mark and a logo mark. And he asks, does a trademark for the word for phase 10 or, or as it appears, or is it the graphics I mean? So can you explain the difference between a logo mark and a word mark? Yeah, so a word mark is just what the title entails. It's a word. So uh, the, the the joining together of that phrase or word is the trademark. Now, the graphical use of that word mark is a different trademark. Okay. Uh, so we have the trademark in both word and graphics for phase 10, the phrase or the words phase 10. But then if you have a graphical usage of that mark, that would be a separate trademark or mm -hmm. copyright. How can real quick? Uh, this is it gets a little detailed. The classification is it very broad with Phase Ten? I mean, does it cover a lot of stuff? Just not not just card games. Yeah, it covers games. So whether it's a card game or a board game, we cover it all. Okay. Um, you have different categories of of. Uh, did you say trademarks or copyright? Well, I think um, cop, uh, trademark. 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 Yeah, yeah uh, trademark. Yeah, it can cover different categories. Got so it, um, it depends. If it was a textile in the textile industry, that would be a totally different uh, application and, and category. Sure. So yeah, I don't know how many. I think it's twenty some odd uh, different yes. categories that you must fall into, and and uh, they only give you trademarks as they apply. So you can't. I can't take phase 10 and cover all 20 some odd categories, even <laughs> though I'm not marketing in those. Got it. You got to You have to actually sell products in those no. categories. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. Very good. Um, this one's perfect for you, uh, Ken. This is from Gary. Aren't card games much cheaper to produce with the chance of a higher profit? as opposed to board games? Then he expands on it. A card game can be produced for under $3. Uh, retail and sell for up to 10. A board game can cost uh, from $4 and up and retail for 20 to make a decent profit. Card games can also be positioned on the shelf, such as peggables, end caps, checkout lines. Board games fight for shelf space close to eye level. So what are your thoughts for, for prices and profitability for card games as opposed to board games? Now, now that's a very good question. On a per piece basis, you're going to make less uh, revenue and profit on a card game because of its lower uh, price uh, point, mm -hmm. uh, both wholesale and retail. However, you make it up in volume um, because more people will spend five ninety nine for a card game uh, or any game at that price than they would for ten or fifteen or twenty. So every five dollars you go up, you reduce the number of sales you're going to make. Um, so card games make it up in volume. Uh, phase ten for the first time. I think it was last year I was told by Mattel, we made it into the top 10 of games worldwide in terms of uh, uh, sales volume. Um, and 
it's number two behind Uno, which is number one in all categories of games. So, uh, but we make it up in volume. So I know that the lady who invented Jenga, she sells probably as many games. Uh, I'm sorry, she, she makes total revenue about as much as we do on, on the physical phase tens. But um, uh, the way her contract is situated, I make more royalties because of the way we situated our royalty agreement and, and the volume that we get. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. So I guess the short answer is uh, you'll make you'll make more per piece on a board game than you will a card game, but card games will sell two and three and four times the volume of that board game. Yeah, it's kind of an impulse thing. It's a stocking stuffer. Yeah, put it's it in as, as your as your, uh, your questioner said. I mean, you will have it available perhaps more positions in the store. At Walmart right now, I was in a Walmart today. I, I go out around every uh, three or four weeks or at least once a month and check the stores, Walmart, Target, and some of the local retailers just to see the game on the shelf and see what's happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was in a Walmart today and we have two pegs there. Uh, depending on the footprint of the store, sometimes we'll have four. Mm -hmm. So that Walmart knows we're gonna sell a lot of volume, whereas a Monopoly has six games sitting there or 12 at best, you know, and I might have 48 games on the show. Yeah. Mm. Good point, good point. Margaret says, in addition to the trade dress of his cards and the copyright of the rules and the trademark of the name, is there anything else that you protected? Uh, no, it's, it's, it's trade dress, uh, rules, uh, uh, brand, that's it. Okay, Lisa says, um, showing strangers for input without a provisional question mark is this considered risky public exposure? Do you recommend a patent pending first? So when I guess essentially, if you got to do some game testing and stuff, how do you how do you protect yourself? Maybe with strangers or um, yeah. what do you do? You got two options. You can uh, get them to sign an NDA and thereby keeping it confidential and therefore not public. Uh, it's not a big deal in, in copyrights, by the way, because the minute you produce your instructions, you've got a copyright. You just then need to register it with the feds. So for games that are copyright written, you don't have to worry too much. Uh, if you've got a patented product um, or a patentable product, you uh, could get your reviewers to sign a non-disclosure agreement, an NDA, thereby keeping it uh, confidential and not public. And the second option is to file a PPA, which I'm sure you guys educate people about, uh, far, far less expensive than a patent. Uh, they can probably do it themselves and get themselves some patent pending status, and that can be a good form of protection. Cool. One last one, um, and this should be your guys' prompts to type your thank you into the question box for Ken. Uh, Juan write, writes, thank you, Mr. Johnson. That was truly an awesome webinar. One of my favorites so far. You are a legend, two exclamation marks, regards uh, Juan. So and there's a bunch okay. of other nice ones that people typed in here too. So this is thank your guys' you. opportunity to type in your thank yous for, for Ken. I won't be able to read them all, but I'll, I'll make sure to send them off to you, Ken. Yeah, so, so Ken, where can, they, where can they purchase your book? Uh, it's available on Amazon. Um, I don't know if you guys have a link available to your, your uh, listeners, but um, if you're going to search for it, search for it under the simple plan and then with my name, Ken Johnson, it should pop up and I, I'd love to uh, to uh, have you read it and you could reach out to me, you know, read the book, reach out to me. My information and contacts are in the book mm -hmm. and I'm happy to answer any questions after you read it and uh, help you along with it. So I'd love to have uh, people read it and uh, evaluate it for me. So and if you want to give a review on Amazon, uh, that'd be terrific. So I appreciate it. Buy oh. the book, get his email. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, uh, you have anything you want to say in closing? I think it's, we come up to no, the I hour here. Is, I, I think Kenneth is absolutely fantastic. He's the nicest guy I've ever met. He's knowledgeable, successful. He's got the the winning plan, the simple plan. It's the winning plan. So I'm just <laughs> really happy that he's in our world now, everybody. So make sure you read it, learn as much as you can, reach out to Ken. And Ken, thank you very much for coming on tonight. Thank you. I just say one more thing to the inventors out there. You know, you will face challenges, 
uh, there will be some headwinds, but you know, keep your head down. If you have an invention that passes the evaluation test, just keep working on it. If in fact, though, you find out that it doesn't, just shelve that idea and work on the next. You're creative, you came up with one, you'll come up with others. Remember, phase 10 was not my first game. And I almost considered giving up, but I decided to try again. And that second time was a charm and it, I hit phase 10. So don't be discouraged if, if you run into headwinds, keep working at it, switch from one invention to the next. Once you learn the simple plan and, and some of the help that Steven and Andrew provide, you'll find that that right product. You just have to keep working. Wonderful. Yeah, 33 years of royalties. Is that accurate, Ken? That's crazy. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Right. And, and Thank you. Quite frankly, Thank guys, you. I got to tell you, last year was a good year, but this year so far is is going to be my best year ever. So it just wow. shows you there, there's potential. You could really, really do well and make a good living, but you have to work at it. It doesn't come easy, but if you work at it, you can, you can make it. Got it. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. And I remind everybody to take care, keep inventing, and we'll catch up with you next time. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone.